My name's John, uh, Syracuse University, and my talk is called Twen Chung, Articulations of an Anxiety Over uh, Transmission in Wudong Shan. And it really, this is part of a longer project. I was in Wudong Shan for a couple years, uh, but it started out as, of course, I'm in religious studies, I was looking for Taoists. You know, I come to Wudong Shan, and I see Taoists and Taoism everywhere. Uh, as you can see in the picture, there's a man dressed all in white, long hair, flashing a sword, standing on a Taiji symbol with the Bagua all around, all the markings of Taoism <laughs> everywhere. And so Wudong Chan is developing itself in this image of a Taoist heritage site. Uh, and yet when I asked people, well, I told people I was studying Taoism, they said, you have to go on the mountain. So uh, you get this sort of impression when you enter Wudong Chan that it is this mountain site that is gated, and the town conceives of itself oftentimes as bifurcated. Uh, religious activity, which is Taoist, is going to happen on the mountain. And what happens below the mountain is not Taoism, maybe it's Taoist culture. And for purposes of access and my own interests, I went with the Taoist culture uh, most of the time. But instead of finding Taoist, Taoist, Taoist priests, as I would call them, uh, I ended up finding half Taoists and Chuan Chengren, which is what we'll talk about today, inheritors and transmitters of the arts. Uh, and Tuan Chong has got this idea of uh, passing along, taking from somebody, inheriting from somebody, and then continuing to pass it on in this connected lineage. Right? So it's a term about lineage. But I want to analyze today, how is this term working in Wudong Shan? What's at stake in it? And is there any value in understanding the martial arts as Taoist? So if we're talking about uh, inheritance of a tradition, it doesn't matter that it's the Taoist religious tradition that it's rooting itself in. So the basic outline is I'm going to introduce the development uh, and redevelopment of Wudong Chan since the 1980s, after reform and opening up when uh, government relaxed its restrictions on these cultural activities and religious activities. Um, we'll discuss how Chuan Chung is working here uh, as a concern over transmission retransmitting, rediscovering, and marketing in this marketplace of entrepreneurship within the cultural industry, how this works through historical connection, and talk about three specific modes of critique. One is through lineage, one is critique of government action, and another is this discussion of how connected are you to Taoism itself, um, and then give some conclusions. Um, a brief background, uh, as you can see, I did some martial arts training and I loved it. Uh, I was in a total of almost two years in Wudong Shan, two different periods. Uh, happened to be through COVID. There were some interruptions there. I studied at three different schools, uh, two different lineages, as well as many independent masters, and conducted semi-structured interviews, mostly participant observation. In Wudong Shan, you're reminded in discussions with people and in the traces on the mountain itself that there has been this historical rupture. It's not the first time, uh, but in the Cultural Revolution, there was this break of tradition. There was kicking all the Taoists and the martial arts off the mountain and reutilizing the temples for military purposes. Uh, and so you can still see on that red wall traces of this Cultural Revolution slogan. And you can see all of these heritage, uh, all the gods are in disrepair and have had to be revitalized. Uh, the mountain itself traces a history to, uh, I mean, before the Ming Dynasty, before 1400s, but it became important to the empire in the 1400s um, as the Ming emperor tried to legitimize himself by building up all these temples. So it really expands, and as you go to the mountain, what you're experiencing is this Ming Dynasty root of temples. So this is actually, in Wudong Shan, what the government's trying to promote is this tourism, tourism development, and a pilgrimage route for the god of the mountain, Jungle. So you go through a very nicely articulated history of the development of this god of the mountain. And that's what you participate in, most people. Uh, it's very successful, it costs 40 US dollars to enter, so it's expensive to get there. And it's, they're the only religious sites actively accepted uh, for performance of religious activities. So clearly there's some barriers to religion there. Um, but clear, also it's successful 
many millions of dollars. Uh, this is suspiciously 888 million visitors. Uh, a little bit too auspicious, that number, from the local <laughs> press. But I wasn't able to find yet a better number. So, uh, yes, but you see the map here. They lay out very neatly. This is what the mountain looks like. This is what Wudang is. Um, but simultaneously with this religious reintroduction, you had the reintroduction of the martial artists. And they were actually connected in the 1980s. This is mostly oral history I'm going off of that I continue to try to verify. Um, but so you had this process of going out, rediscovering the martial arts. They hosted a martial arts tournament of Wudong style in 1980. And the story goes, there was a couple of people that remembered something from their childhood. And most of the specialists in this art, it's not that they were gone, but they weren't in Wudong anymore. So they sent out people to go rediscover it. And the government started scholarly work, sponsored a press, promoted scholarship on the history so they could rediscover the history of martial arts in the area and remind people of Wudong. Uh, so the Taoist Association itself was in control of promoting martial arts in Wudong in the beginning. And so there wasn't really an opening to public participation. Uh, when I talked to these masters, how they got there, either it's a family connection or they, they had to enter the Tao. They had to take up some sort of precepts as Taoists live in the temple, and then when that sort of fell apart, adjacent to the temple. But on this map, you can see there's a few green dots hidden behind the red dots. Those red dots are all the temples that they've been redeveloping. Um, there was also then, well, we'll develop martial arts. They did Guo Shu, so these martial, national martial arts, and some Shaolin styles. So as they start to redevelop Wudong, the government says, well, we'll take anybody. It doesn't matter. They'll take Shaolin style, they'll take anything. And it was very successful for a period, and they could get up to 1,000 students in a, at any one time. And they were the Wenwu style, which is a boarding school. So you train them in all their education uh, up from a young age and the martial arts. But this is the map that I put together myself as I traveled around the area. I, there's a few schools that I forgot to put on. I lost my map, and I had to do it from memory. Uh, but. Since the 2000s, we see the first generation of disciples that were on the mountain and moving off of the mountain or opening their own schools and making this public access and becoming part of transmission in the area, taking up this duty to transmit. There are two main lineages, and they are stylistically opposed, and uh, most of the arguments you see today are against one another, so against the legitimacy of the other group, but they are the main lineages. Other ones are also there, but they only have one or two schools, maybe. These will have 20 schools. And they just keep popping up and expanding. But the, sky, the size of the schooling, of course, goes down as the government and these individuals wanted to start with a distinctly Wudong appearance. Well, let's go small scale. We're Taoists. We're not Shaolin. We like what Shaolin's doing, but we're going to be more intimate. We're going to be Taoist in this discipleship relationship. Um, so they changed the size. They also re-emphasized Taoist aspects in internal martial arts, explicitly not external, um, which is these hard styles of Shaolin. Um, and then the money for all of this doesn't come from traditional discipleships and things. It comes mostly from, well, summer camps and then short-term studies for health practices. In this growing upper middle class, they can spend as much as $8,000 for three days of not eating. So uh, it's really popular. Choice for not catering. So uh, it's a thriving market, right? But I, I, this history is part of this precarious legitimacy. You're balancing this opportunity, a sense of duty, with a real fragility, and there's cracks in what is being developed. So there's all this anxiety, and Chuan Cheng, inheritance and transmission, is a central term to how an individual master will be positioned as what I'm calling a duty-bound entrepreneur. It's all a modern commercial marketplace, but the sense of duty and tradition constrains them and also raises their importance. Uh, so again, I'm looking at the lineage claims, government initiatives, and Dallas ideology, and how this represents worries and hopes for the past, present, and the future. But why does Chuanzhong matter to people? Uh, in one, it's government recognition. So this is an official status you can get. And it's sort of haphazardly applied. Uh, the grand master who had a school and was training since the 80s, 
I read on his website he was recently recognized in 2012 as an official inheritor. Um, so that's a little bit late. But on the wall at the school, they often masters will bring me in and show me the plaque the government gave them to say that they're officially inheritors. This is official status. And that's important. It legitimizes you. But it's, it's also important from a moral standpoint because when we're talking about this inheritance, you have a duty to a cultural past as a Chinese person, as a member of Wudang. Uh, you have a, a duty to a nationalist present. Uh, this is part of the rebirth and rediscovery of China as a cultural force in the world. And martial arts is a part of that that they're proud to be doing. And it's part of local development. A rising tide lifts all boats. I'm making some money, but really we're all making money <laughs> and we're all helping the arts. Uh, from some of my field notes, Tuancheng transmission is about the very possibility of knowledge. So we have a history of transmission, but if you don't have that direct relationship with a master, that direct teaching, you can't understand all the specifics, all the little tricks and ways of memorizing things, all the real meaning you're looking for, that's always left out. And in the second quote here, if you have martial arts, if you don't have martial arts, you'll still have culture, but you won't have traditional culture. And so they're positioning martial arts as the continuing of tradition, and it's specifically through Tuancheng transmission that makes that possible. But one of the first ways to start criticizing this, you could say, through the government. So government is trying to make this a developed area, try to revitalize the region. And you can look at historical pictures, and there was almost nothing. And now buses are going constantly, and they're making millions of dollars. But they're really promoting tourism first, and then they're putting overburden on the martial arts school. This is what masters tell me. If you want to be on the mountain, you have to pay extreme taxes. Uh, and the government isn't promoting you for your schooling, even though with you, people stay for three years. And with tourism, they stay for one day. But there seems to be a disconnect there. So they're constantly trying to get the government to respect their importance. Uh, the government initially promoted Shaolin and the national martial arts. Uh, and that is undermining what we have today because of that bad start. Post 2000, they insist on health practices. So they would go around the schools and say, you really have to teach health practices. This is where the market is. So all of these masters that were learning hard martial arts originally, they really want to just teach their martial arts, are now constrained. They feel like, well, they have to teach people to meditate, all these things that they weren't initially interested in at all. And this is government force. Uh, and then really, it's a preference of image over fidelity. So, they start by making all this propaganda. Wudang arts are mysterious and spiritual. Then anyway, just do some kicks, do some punches, wear a Taoist outfit, and that's what Wudang martial arts are. This confuses everyone. And as these schools keep doing this, the bigger, the more they do, the lower Wudang's reputation, or they've ended up transmitting Chuan Chang, it all a mess. Why? Crooked. Wrong. And then really what we start talking about is lineage criticism. In this process of loss and rediscovery, nobody really denies this. Every, I mean, it would be silly to say Wudong never had a rupture. You can say we went to rediscover it, and we, still, we can still say I'm tied to that master who was tied to the mountain before he was kicked off. Uh, but the method of the discovery tends to be what matters when we talk about is this legitimate anymore. So Zhong Yimong, the grand master of Sanfeng lineage, says, I don't talk about sex and lineages. He doesn't want to. Why? Because he studied so many. He calls on the outstanding hundred masters. Seems very impressive. But Wudong sect has rules about what kinds of content you can teach. For instance, Wudong takes Taiji as the highest, followed by Xing Yi Quan and Ba Gua Zhou. This belongs to Wudong's internal martial arts systems. The others, like Ba Ji Quan, they don't have any real connection to Wudong Quan. So it's like the government said, He's got a beard, he's older, he looks the part, he looks Taoist, it's good enough. So he doesn't have any knowledge really of what Wudong is, but he looks good enough, and that's good enough for the government. Uh, Sanfeng lineage often uses their skill, pure skill, as a counter argument to these lineage claims. We don't care where it came from, we have the ability, and you want to compete with us, we'll always beat you. Xuan um, Pai the opposite of the Sanfeng lineage that Zhong Yunlong collected from everywhere haphazardly, they, they don't really make 
very clear claims to lineage, but they draw themselves into a longer historical imagination. So if we're talking about internal martial arts, what that means is internal alchemy. It means John San Fung came up with this idea of developing your internal states 800 years ago, but before that, Chen Fang, who came up with internal alchemy, and before that, Lao Tzu and Yinqi. And you get these stories of Lao Tzu, Confucius visiting Lao Tzu, and Lao Tzu's doing standing meditation, which I'd never heard before. Uh, but it, you draw these long connections. So expertise in these sorts of practices stands in for any concrete claims of where it came from, because it tells you we are purely Taoist and purely Buddha. Um, the scattered lineages don't get to have this. And again, government scholarship made possible these claims. Government supported the production of scholarship that reminded people and verified Zhang Sanfeng, this mythical figure, as a Taoist, uh, who came up with all of this really in history, and we can trace it back. But then we talk about the present. This was a, a worry about the past. What are the practice of transmission? How do you transmit in the present? And how does that become illegitimate? So one is people are against no direct instruction. You delegate to coaches, but that's not real inheritance. I want to teach from a master. That's the only real inheritance. And that's inherent to the logic of transmission because they have the knowledge and the ability in their body, charismatically and through learning, that they can teach you. If you're learning from coaches, that's not real. Uh, but these big schools, often in the Sanfeng lineage, will say, the master can't teach all these classes. The only people that say you need to learn from the master, one, they're, they're students that have a desire for it, but there are other masters that have such small schools that they can keep teaching themselves. But when you stop being able to teach, the teaching dies, right? So you need to train coaches, and by training coaches, that only happens through letting them run class. Um, so you've actually become a criminal to the past if you don't do it our way. If you keep doing it the traditional way, master to disciple directly, well, that's not sustainable. We need to keep pushing these arts. One thing that nobody ever really says is right is when there's a school who uses coaches that weren't taught by the master. So you could say, well, they're using coaches, but they, taught, they were taught directly by the master, so it's the same thing. That connection is there clearly. So you're the master's disciple, even though you never learned from him because you learned from somebody who did. But if a school didn't use it, didn't use coaches, they just hired coaches from outside, taught them quickly the forms, that has a bit of a feeling of not being transmission because he just went out to other places and asked coaches to come to his school. Uh, there's also a question of commercialism, and again, this gets to the, what are the standards of becoming a disciple? Sanfeng says, whatever, you want to pay us $700? No, you want, how much is it? It's, uh, it's like 10,000 quai, so I'm not going to do the math, but you can just give the money, you get a special sword and your lineage name and all of that. And Xuanwu says, well, we do it the traditional way. We have this standard that Zhang Sanfeng uh, put up. We have to investigate you for three years. And if you don't do it this way, you're risking the integrity of the arts from a Shramu perspective. Um, but all of this, if we're talking about the future of lineages, it gets at this point of crisis and extinction. So you can keep doing it the old way, but you're going to risk ruining and losing everything. Your duty is to keep going. Why are we always talking about chuan chung, chuan chung, chuan chung, transmission? Because these days, lots of people don't like traditional things. Really, lots of people don't like it. It's almost gone now. It's about to disappear. When, <laughs> when something is about to disappear and you're still blocking it, this I won't teach. That person I won't take. That I won't do. I want. I want to maintain my such and such. I want to do small. That's fine. I don't want to do big. If it keeps up that way, it's gone. Really gone. Because if Wudong doesn't have a couple of big schools, 10, 20 years, be even fewer students. Why do you think we have the status of intangible national cultural heritage? We belong to the intangible. It's going to disappear very soon. The national government started to take the matter seriously. Do you think we can't take it seriously? And you're tied into this national, right, that national push. It validates you, maybe diluting, maybe risking integrity, because you have to get it out there. And then one other connection is this idea that uh, 
Shamu is going to say, we are the real Taoists. Everybody in Wudong is going to say they're Taoists. But what does that mean? And Shamu will criticize Sanfang lineages because they're all scattered. Uh, they only really learn one kind of Wudong, true Wudong form. But what Shamu sect means by that is that we are connected to internal alchemy, Taoist cultivation, of the likes of Chang Tang. You're going to do internal alchemy. And that is all part of standing meditation and these Tai Chi forms. The true purpose is entering the Tao. But if you're not tied to that transmission, you don't have the true arts in the beginning, that spiritual possibility is for nothing. It, it's not possible at all. Um, so what this looks like in practice is Shamu schools perform this by starting from stillness rather than moving. At a Sanfeng school, you often start from hard form, fast form, splits. I spent two months, five hours a day standing. You know, so very different orientation. And that legitimizes them as Taoists. Uh, I would also say, does it matter in Wudong's martial arts if it's Taoist? And one way I'm thinking about it right now, still in progress, of course you've got the fighting abilities. You can say, John Sanfang's methods work for fighting. But the future, maybe not, may is, maybe it isn't in fighting, right? So maybe it's in traditional health. Well, Taoism has that. Maybe it's in spiritual transformation. Taoism provides you that sort of coherent image. Maybe it's in traditional music, ritual, worship, a way of being together convivially, right? or a form of authentic being that the modern era doesn't see. Uh, and again, that's in these direct relationships of masters and disciples and Kung Fu brothers. Uh, it also ties you into cultural pride duty, a higher tradition that's always going to elevate these low arts. If you have the veneer of Taoism, you are high, you are dignified. Uh, it allows you economic opportunity because the trends are towards spiritual growth, are towards spiritual marketplaces. And it expands your field of competition and draws people in. And I, you do see this happening in Wudong. When they talk about transmitting, suddenly it's widening out. Before it was just doing some martial arts, and now everywhere you go, they're teaching them the guqin, they're teaching them the flute. They're teaching them calligraphy and to study the classics. And year after year, it just starts to broaden with minimal success, but you know, it's trying to happen. And I think that Taoism is a way to articulate transmission and inheritance in a broader fashion that allows them to move beyond the martial arts. Uh, and some possible conclusions, I think that when we're looking at transmission and inheritance, Chuan Chang, these are a means to analyzing contemporary politics of intangible cultural heritage in China, a huge growing industry, uh, and the utility of religious martial arts. Uh, inheritance discourses show an understanding of the past, the fragility of heritage in the present, and the opportunity and un uncertainty of the future. Uh, solving a perceived lack in modernity for many students also is something that we can see, a critique of modernity and a move towards something else. They say they want a mode of knowledge and relationship associated with this cultural past, however legitimate or real that would be. And this direct relationship to a master gets modernized with fewer obligations for the feeling of entering something else. That's what I had for now. So. Uh, so, some years ago I started doing, when I was in Cardiff, I began a project on what was going, to, what was called at the time, and what I was going to do, and I will still do, on the modern invention of the category of traditional martial arts, and that was going to be something that spanned China, Japan, and Korea. Uh, and at the time, I had two, as it turned out, completely incorrect ideas. One was that the path of creating traditional martial arts in those three countries was the same; they're not. And the second one was that I had resolved most of the important issues before I could take, I could basically just take up that task, and I was going to sort of do some history, and then I was going to do a section on movies to follow it, because uh, Megan uh, pointed out to me at the time that movies are real, and uh, I took that to heart after I, my ego had enough time to, you know, recover. Uh, and, um, I, uh, and I thought that would be great. 
and you know, places like Korea where it didn't, they didn't have the same transmission. And I started very narrowly looking at text, and then I realized that I couldn't do that project until I resolved the issue of internal martial arts and what this category was and where it stood. And I was not going to touch these issues in Japan and Korea uh, because there was quite enough in China, and there is a transmission issue, and it gets very complicated. And whereas I can work in Japanese, I cannot work in Korean. Uh, so there were all those issues there. So I ended up shifting to this question of internal martial arts and how it was going to work and how, whether I could sort this out. Um, and maybe that will work. I was doing nicer transitions. There we go. Um, the other thing that came into this is that uh, I am, by inclination and training, a pre-modernist. And I get very, I find working in the modern period extremely tedious. Uh, and, and often, you, you sort of start feeling like very, uh, you're constantly admonishing the modernists that they, they keep not thinking about the past and they don't know about the past. And it just gets very boring, you know. You know that's wrong, no, that's wrong. And, and to be fair, I do this in China. Uh, and, and, and Chinese people get rather mortified when they find out that the, the visiting foreigner actually knows their history and they don't. But that only gets amusing for a little while. And the other thing is I have a, a book coming out later this year, which is a modern book, which is on the, trans, the interpretation of Swin Zvingfa in the West. And so I'm kind of done for the moment on doing this, but I'm recovering. So with that background, let me start here. And, uh, and if there are any really dedicated internal martial artists here, they'll obviously get very angry at me and want to attack me, but I know it will be very slow. <laughs> and, uh, get away. Um, or they're just going to stand there, you know, standing right here. Uh, so th this concept of internal martial arts, and I put that in quotes, is a 20th century category. So let, let's get that out of the way. It's produced as part of a nexus of political concerns. Uh, the construction of internal martial arts has been so pervasive and critical to our current sense of the martial arts that we've actually worked too hard to try to find a connection to the past. And as John just wrote, actually I was very excited with your paper. It, it solved a lot of issues for me, things that I, I <laughs> can only touch on lightly, which is that there's this really hard work that goes into like, it's got a connection to the past. And one of the things that makes this paper and this research possible for me is the digitization, if we want to get into real, the modernization of stuff, the digitization of hundreds, if not thousands, of texts, which allows one to confidently survey mass, the massive corpus of Chinese texts and say, Nei Jia Chuan doesn't show up. It just doesn't show up anywhere. You know, so it shows up in one spot, and then what I'm talking about here is a gap in the texts. Uh, so my goal then is to, to break down this idea and to reevaluate how it how it came about. So now, while I can't, I can argue based on textual sources that there were no internal martial arts. Again, I'm doing my scare quotes. I, I had a principal in elementary school who used to speak like that, so I always feel like I'm Mr. Graziani. Like, um, <laughs> We can't, we don't find this term, it's really not, there were no, I can't, I can argue based on textual sources that there were no internal martial arts before the 20th century, but I can't prove that there were no practices that we might now characterize as internal martial arts. Uh, so we have the historical thing of, you know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, but nor is it proof. So we don't have sources, I can't, prove that things were happening. I also can't prove they weren't happening. And so what you will run into often with people who are trying to justify this and saying it as an ancient heritage is, well, I know it was happening. And you're like, yeah, you can't prove it wasn't happening. It's like, yeah, but you can't prove it wasn't. Not what I know. Um, mm. So this term internal martial arts, though, has a very specific value judgment inherent in its construction. Internal martial arts were constructed at first as a preservation of the core value of martial arts practice and a means to maintain that practice in the face of social, political, and cultural change. The original development of this concept in China was quite different than that. As I mentioned, that happened in Japan and Korea. So I'm going to begin with the early attempts to provide a longer history of internal martial arts 
and explain and then discuss why internal martial arts developed in the 20th century. Um, so, since I had this like sort of previously dot dot dot. Uh, so while searching for the earliest use of the term internal martial arts, neja, 20th and 21st century scholars discovered the epitaph for Wang Zhongnan, written by Huang Zongxi in 1669. And I apologize for those of you who are not Chinese speakers, and when I say, well, I'm gonna use the surnames Huang and Wang, and it may sound like mwah, 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 and okay. But I'll try to keep them as clear as possible. Uh, so Wang Zhongnan was a Ming Dynasty loyalist. The Ming Dynasty fell in 1644, ran from 1368 to 1644. And so he was a 17 th century Ming loyalist, which meant he lived across the Ming Qing transition, and he didn't want to serve the Qing. <coughs> Whether he was asked to serve the Qing is another issue. So he was a Ming Dynasty loyalist who trained a man by the name of Huang Baijia. Huang Baijia was the son of a man named Huang Zongxi. Now both Huang's father and son wrote records of Wang Zhongnan and his martial arts. So uh, Huang Baijia wrote a biography of Huang, who was his teacher, that described his art and characterized it as Neijia, internal. <coughs> Huang Zongxi wrote the epitaph for Wang Zhongnan, which provides a history of Wang's martial arts training the story, and some stories about fights that he won. He also describes Wang's martial art as Neijia in opposition to Shaolin. This is a very important thing. We have this Shaolin is hard style, Wudang being you know, internal or soft. Now critically, we have this story, and I think these stories are really important to look at. They're not, uh, you can't just bypass them, and a lot of what I'm doing here is looking at the very specific language. Uh, when Wang Zhongnan is, is shown to defeat seven or eight soldiers, he doesn't, you know, we're thinking he's supposed to knock them down. If you read a lot of translations of this, they will say he knocked down or you know, he beat up. The, Language is different than that. It says that he chirpu. He he, and in a subsequent sentence, it says that when he bore, he these terms I'll come back to in a sec. The men that he used uh, acupuncture points when he he bored them. Uh, that that even to the point of causing death, wooziness, or muteness. The issue is that this term, uh, the first term chirpu, can only mean to throw someone on the ground. It is not a striking art. So if you jerk with someone, you are throwing them supinated to the ground. Um, now, the term bo, which is translated something like show bo, to box, things like that, it has a number of meanings. It can mean either to spring upon someone, to seize them, and uh, as some of you know, you know I'm, a, I'm doing jujitsu now, so of course I'm always very excited when we get to grab someone. You know, I don't, I don't want to hit someone. Uh, it can mean to strike them with the fist, uh, or to what we translate as to box. So a couple of stories that follow that show Wong's mastery of acupuncture points and knowledge of their effects. Uh, Hao Chin writes this wonderful book on uh, what's it, Dao Zhao Wu Shu, uh, Taoism and Martial Art. Fabulous book. Uh, and he says, look, Wang Zhongnan's internal martial arts must have been a grappling-based martial art. Now, all the Tai Chi people are very unhappy at the moment. Because now it's like, wait, wait a minute, you know, or you know, this is suddenly we're getting a very different characterization in the original formulation of this concept about what it is to do an internal martial art and what it's based on. Um, so this is throwing based rather than striking based, uh, and actually this dovetails with an observation that Randy Brown, who was at I'm trying to remember which martial arts studies conference, he's he practices uh, praying mantis, gong fu and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And because he was a jiu-jitsu person while he was doing praying mantis, he's realizing, wait a minute, these are all setups. All of these positions are setups for throws. And he began, so he, he was talking to me, he asked me about this, and I'm like, oh, this is really quite interesting. And because then he was showing me some of the, the praying mantis things, so like, oh, this is a collar tie, and this is, and, and this is what we're doing seeing with the people doing hema, right? You know, you, you begin to see these positions as very, you know, if you're doing this, it's going to a throw if you're doing that. And so we have this very interesting issue uh, that grappling and throwing techniques, uh, as Randy sees it, are implicit in praying mantis. And of course, praying mantis, which is supposed to be on one hand a hard style, but, ah, but if you get good at it, it becomes a soft style. 
And then there's the internal, the internal stuff. So if Wang Zhongnan is actually sweeping his opponents as an internal martial artist, what is to say about his martial arts practice? And some of you have done, if you've done pressure points and things like that, you know, it's, a, it's actually much easier when you're grabbing someone to apply pressure points than to strike it, because as a friend of mine who's an acupuncturist points out, you know, the, the, the acupuncture point is smaller than the head of the needle. Um, but if you can grab someone, you can put pressure on things much more easily, you know, to just, we have this nice idea that you're gonna, you know, hit someone or throw something, that's, that's charming. I wish I could. Um, let me show you that. Um, so both Huangs describe Wang's art as derived from Zhang Zanfang uh, in the Song Dynasty. And some of you know, I'm, I'm a Song historian, uh, uh, so this is always charming for me because Zhang Zanfang does not show up in any Song records. Uh, Zhang Zanfang was an expert in Shaolin martial arts. Shaolin was also not big in the Song as a martial arts center. Uh, who then reverse engineers it to be able to defeat Shaolin martial arts. So again, we're seeing a fight within martial arts community and market it. Uh, by definition, the internal martial art was the opposite of Shaolin's external school. And interestingly, Wang taught, taught Huang Baijia at the, uh, Tie Bo, Tie Bo si, the at the Iron Buddha Temple. So the, the Taoist internal master is teaching internal martial arts, which is contrary to Shaolin, at a Buddhist temple because, of course, he didn't have enough space in his house. And where do you practice martial arts? You go to the nearest temple, because they have open spaces. Um, now, uh, Huang Zhongxi relates the story that Zhang Sanfeng was a dancer at Wudang, who was summoned by Song Emperor Huizong. This is always great stuff. The road was blocked by bandits, but that night, Xuan Di, also known as Xuan Wu, uh, or Zhen Wu, uh, doubtless while mistranslates this as Guan Di, it's not Guan Di, it's a different deity entirely. Um, gave Zhang Sanfeng a martial art. So now we have this uh, divine transmission of martial art. That's always great. You know, it's like uh, uh, going up on the mountain in Japan and getting, uh, what do they call those guys with the, you know, the goblet based uh, guys to Tengu. show you? you know, thank you, Tengu. Yeah. Yeah. And so then you see all these guys, ah, oh, I was taught by Tengu. Like, great, you know, awesome. If you've got a school like that, I'm signing up. Um, so. He gives him this martial art that allows him to kill more than 100 bandits single-handedly, not very peaceful and neja there. This is the first connection, though, between the internal school and Taoism. It is also inadvertently an indication that this is actually a Ming story and not a Song story. Because, of course, Wudang is a major Taoist center in the Ming dynasty, and Xuandi was a powerful Taoist deity who was patronized by the third Ming emperor, Yongle, eternal happiness. Uh, who took up that title after he slaughtered his nephew and seized the throne. Uh, and Yongle did that because he won. So he felt that the god had supported him, so he began to support Wudong. It should also be noted, of course, that Shaolin only became famous as a center for martial arts in the Ming Dynasty. And we've got here, I've got a little, where do I want to go? There's the characters for Zhifu, those who are you wanting. Uh, And there we have Bo. And now we have a good tourist picture to get us to Wudong. Oh, man, I almost used that. Yeah, I, it's, they, they really saturated the color. It's great stuff. Um, this is all, I just pulled this off the net. So now there were some dancer or practitioners of internal elixirs. This is a very complicated topic, which I will avoid uh, if I can at all. Uh, sometimes these guys are of Nadan, internal elixir at Wudang. And there may actually have been a guy named Zhang Sanfang at Wudang at the beginning of the Ming Dynasty. Again, another, another tell that there was a guy named that, and they just kind of pushed him back a little bit. And then really, if, you know, the, the Huang, Parrot Fi, were guilty of pushing them back a few centuries, so who cares? I mean, it matters to me, because I'm a Song historian. Uh, you know, surely, but surely the Ming is old enough. Again, not for me, because I'm a Song historian, the Ming is journalism. Uh, but several scholars have recognized the opposition that was created between Buddhism and, uh, and which is foreign, and uh, uh, Taoism, which is native and again traditional Chinese. And so this has political implications. People like Stan Henning point this out, and a lot of other people. Uh, 
So at the beginning of the Qing Dynasty, a dynasty ruled by Manchus, and, who are not Chinese, Wang Zhengnan's power is hidden, uh, it is peaceful, it is humble, and it is in fact greater than the open, violent power surrounding him. So the Fongs were deeply ambivalent about the Qing, although the son actually did pass, he, took, he studied for the exam, I believe he passed, and became a Qing government official. So there's a great deal of political ambivalence in it. The father, who had been a Ming official, could not serve in the Qing. Uh, so tying Wang Zhengnang's art to Wudong and Taoism was a very specific statement about foreigners, against foreigners. So it's even more telling in all of this, though, is that Wang Zhengnang himself is never shown to call his own practice internal. So we never have this thing of the martial artist himself saying, this is what I practice. And in fact, if you look through traditional practice, we, you don't have guys showing up and saying, I practice this art. That's a very late idea. If they did so, we don't know. But we, we don't have Wang Zhengnang saying this, and we don't have a lineage. Wang Zhengnang doesn't talk about I learned from this guy, I learned from that guy. So this gets very interesting. You, you would, and remember, the guys writing these accounts are very educated people. They would be very interested in that information if they had it, and they don't. Um, there is a book, however, in the draft Qing Dynasty history, but that's a you know, 20th century book, uh, which attributes, uh, there's a book attributed in there to Huang Baijiao, the son, called uh, Nei Jia Chuan. So you can go, it's online, I looked it up. It's very short, not very interesting. It's, it's mostly, uh, it would make only make sense to you if you knew the art. It's an aid memoir. Uh, or it's used to generate political capital, cultural capital, because he writes this very short book. I'll, I'll translate this when I do the book. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna translate all the main documents when I'm doing the book, because I prefer to hand you the, the sources and you can make your own judgments. Uh, there's also, interestingly, very importantly, there is a, uh, a book on, uh, a later, uh, there is a book on Zhengnan Shifa, Wang Zhengnan's archery method, also by Huang Baijia. Also not that interesting and not that long, which when you're translating is a good and bad. It's easier to translate, it's short, but not that interesting. Now the brevity suggests, as I said, they're, they're just for an internal school for cultural capital. There is a late Qing book, the categorical, uh, categorized petty matters of the Qing by Xu Ke. This is obviously not Xu Ke, the, the, the director. <coughs> Sui Mark, if Sui Mark were doing that, we would have a different, um, which came out in 1916. So these are all 20th century uh, sources, which mentions internal boxing. So Xu Ke's book, at least, from the perspective of, it's late Qing, early Republican, who refer to internal boxing or internal martial arts. But all these stories, when you look at them, they all go back to the epitaph. They all go back to Huang Zongxi and Huang Baijia. So you're just looking, you're just seeing the same story transmitted. Um, what you're not seeing in all of this is any reference to this term between Huang Zhongxi and Huang Baijia's writing and the 20th century. There is no mention in those centuries of Nei Jia. It doesn't show up. Now, you could say people are practicing, they're just not calling it that. That's possible. But nobody's advertising it, no one's talking about this term, and no one's, at least as far as we can see, no one's characterizing things that way. So we just have this gap which the people in the 20th and 21st centuries are desperately looking around for some reference. This is very similar if you are looking for Qigong references. There are no Qigong references before the 20th century. So then people sort of try to connect Dao Yin with Qigong, but there's no way to do that because they're not connected that way. Are the practices the same? They might be. But, and then you have to try to connect Dao Yin with Taoist practice. All of these things are separate, and so there are people who might be Taoist, who might be doing something that might, we might characterize as eternal martial art, and they might be a Wudang, and they might be there in the Ming Dynasty, and maybe they're also a martial artist. But there are guys who are doing Dao Yin, who are not martial artists, who are not Taoists, so these things, are not, these things don't necessarily go together as the modern guys are trying to say, oh, we've got more, you know, what is it to be this? 
So we now can see where the original term comes from. It's maybe late 19th century, but really it's probably 20th century, and there's a huge gap between that and the present. So where does the term come from? Um, so our current concept appears to have been put forward by Sun Lutang. And, oh, sorry, yeah, there we go. Sorry, I was looking on the screen, so over here. Um, and as you can see, see, we have a photo of it. Always a giveaway that he's modern. Uh, we, we always have everyone, whenever you're doing a, book covers and stuff, and you work in pre-modern, they always want like a colorful image with someone from the past, like, it, not portraits, you know. Um, I, will, I can regale you with hours of issues about fighting over cover art. Uh, I just lost a big fight over cover art for this latest book. I wanted for the cover of the book Paris Hilton, who's reading a copy of Swinz's Art of War translation upside down. And the press said, no. <laughs> uh, I, thought I think they're crazy with have sold a zillion copies just to all her followers. Who cares if they read it as long as they buy it? <laughs> uh, okay, now our current conception of the internal martial arts is put forward by Swin Lutong in the early 20th century. Again, this is not to say it's wrong. We're talking about terminology here, and you could argue that there are these practices and understandings, but how you think about things matters. And I, I, I hope people who all here think that. Uh, you know, were these, how do you connect these things? Swin was writing while working as a martial arts instructor. This is starting to sound very familiar. Like I said, I was watching John's paper going, this is awesome. This is going to be great. I have to do so much less intellectual heavy lifting. Um, he's working as a martial arts instructor, trying to establish his name and his reputation. So he writes books. He writes uh, his first book uh, in 1915, Study of Shimi Chuan. Second book, Study of Bagua Boxing. In 1916, his study of Taiji boxing in 1921, The True Essence of Boxing in 1925, and a manual on Bagua Sword, and this is a Jin, not a Dao, there may be some significance to that, in 1927. The other thing he does that he pioneers is he may well be the first person to publish photographs of Chinese positions in the book in China. I don't know the European side of it, but he actually has photos of people doing positions and um, now, partly as a result of these publications, as well as some contacts he made, in 1919, he is appointed to teach martial arts with a military rank at the presidential palace. It works. He gets a job. <laughs> some of you, you know, get graduate students out there, like, what, you got a job? How do you do that? Well, you write a book, and you suck up to people, and uh, hopefully you get a job. Uh, you might have to sell your soul, but, you know, you can, you can eat. That's okay. Um, now, Swin had a, a very episodic and patchy formal education. He was extremely poor in his childhood, but he did manage to obtain systematic training in several martial arts. Let's guess what they are. Xing Yi Chuan, Ba Hua Chuan, Tai Chi Chuan. And I note here, when you think about the acceptance of these arts and these terms in the West, the best example of what's accepted and what isn't yet is Microsoft Word which does not underline Tai Chi Chuan with a red line uh, written in pinyin, but it does underline Ba Gua Chuan and Xing Yi Chuan with a red line. So Microsoft Word knows that Tai Chi Chuan is a word, and it shouldn't be redlined. So hopefully they'll get to uh, uh, Ba Gua Chuan and all that in the future. Uh, now he also studies Taoism to some extent, he learned some aspects of what it may have been called at the time, qigong. So he's, he's learning these things. Now, not surprisingly, though, when he writes up everything, he formulates this approach to martial arts. How is he going to distinguish it from everything else? How is he going to promote himself? Well, he uses internal school, martial arts. What does that comprise? Xing Yi Chuan, Ba Gua Chuan, Tai Chi Chuan and Taoism. So he creates the school around what he knew. He doesn't create the school around what he doesn't know. You know that's why you know, what don't, we're academics, right? What do we talk about? We, we promote ourselves with the stuff we know, uh, that stuff. And someone says, why don't you do that? Uh, now you can take one or two, well, that's not my field, or oh, that's not important. That, that, give me about 15 years, then it will become not important. Now it's just not my field. And if I don't know it, it's not important. 
Um, he also, interestingly, produces his own style of Taiji, which is derived, and some of you might have actually practiced uh, swim style uh, Taiji. So let me, let me wrap this up here. Um, Swin worked as a bodyguard. He did fight in some competitions, but this was not an aspect of his practice that he stressed. Uh, he was not a famous warrior. He was a famous martial artist. He made himself a famous martial artist. Uh, he also lived through a time of warfare, real wars, including the Boxer Rebellion, the fall of the Qing Dynasty, and the rise of the Republic in China. It was miserable to live in China at that time. It sucked. Um, in these circumstances, the martial arts were not a practical tool of war and politics. Of course, uh, like many people, he loved the martial arts. Uh, and he saw the martial arts, though, in opposition to guns and modern weapons. This distinction is important as it goes to the heart of many of the issues of modern martial arts. For Swim, the martial arts were a very specific set of skills and techniques that had limited relevance to real violence. This is really important to this. Uh, if one were interested in fighting, he suggested, then get a gun. I mean, so he's, you know, we don't have this opposition, this guy, I have internal martial arts, go ahead and shoot me. This is not what this guy's doing. He's like, you know, get a, you know. Uh, realistically speaking, in the time in which he lived, serious fighting involved guns, not unarmed fighting skills, or swords. Uh, he also con uh, uh, confronted the after effects of the Boxer Rebellion. After the Boxer Rebellion, martial artists were humiliated because obviously it didn't work. Um, martial arts had been too great to delegitimize. So no amount of training or mystical and incantation could overcome guns. So why would you associate yourselves with these guys? So now the people who advocated for, and to some extent we see even today, who advocated for the practice of Chinese martial arts were people who loved practicing Chinese martial arts. But they were faced with the question of what value martial practice had in a time of widespread warfare uh, with guns. Unarmed or hand-to-hand -hand skills with weapons were, you know, were, these were not that functional uh, in that environment. So for Sun Lu Tong, this meant a new formulation, internal martial arts, that branded the arts he had studied, along with Taoism, into one package. His internal martial arts emphasized the health benefits. Again, we're seeing the same concepts uh, of traditional martial arts. It's traditional, it's got your health benefits. And it doesn't do away with fighting, but it downplays it. Uh, and some of you, when you're doing martial arts, it, it changes as you get you know, different parts of your life. Sometimes you're, oh, I've got to learn to fight. And then later on, you're like, no. And then you get older, and you're like, uh, you know, can I fight? Uh, you know. Um, Swin may well have thought uh, that the connection between any martial art and fighting was obvious. I mean, it's a martial art. He is teaching that. And I was once asked at a conference, so are martial arts really about fighting? And you're like, well, there's the name. Uh, but his, his innovation was to emphasize these other aspects. So his emphasis, emphasis on the health benefits of the martial arts the de-emphasizing fighting was also consistent with the late Qing Republican period shift to larger, more modern martial arts, schools for middle class people, factory workers, not factory, but more, much more office workers who were looking to get some exercise. Uh, urban workers needed some kind of physical recreation that was both good for them and modern. Modern was a good word for a lot of people at that time, but then there was that traditional thing, right? Um, so from the martial arts teacher's point of view, this offered a way to make a living, something that he really couldn't do beforehand. So I will stop there with this random image, which may or may not have relevance. We can talk about that if you want. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, very good. Sorry, I missed the first one. but. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I think you're right to stress the nationalistic side of uh, Nadia because uh, internalists as opposed to the external Buddhism, which was espoused by the Qing, at least initially. Uh, <clears throat> um, however, you didn't mention the Japan side of it, which is to catch up with Japan who had just, just defeated the Qing dynasty and was moving in on the Republic um, and their great 
uh, international fame with jujitsu, the, the soft art supposedly, uh, which was used by the Shaolin book, um, which was again uh, a popular book on introducing Chinese martial arts. Uh, and of course the Nature had to sort of combat that. Um, I think Kirsten Tang was involved with the militarists, was he not? Yeah, he was. He was a Republican. He got in. He got in with the Guomindang. Not no, not the Guomindang. I mean the the pre Guomindang. Oh yeah, well, so, yeah. So there are there are various uh, generals. That, yeah. So there are a bunch of the generals who are into martial arts. Yeah. Who promote this stuff? Yeah, yeah. And so there's a, there's a bunch of high ranking before the Northern yeah. Expedition, which yeah. was basically when the Republic squashed these guys. Yeah, in Beijing around there. Yeah, the martial arts were running around trying to get <coughs> patronage, and so there's some yeah. military guys who are, and some some of them actually want, and they're actually films, by the way. You can actually see they have early films of these guys practicing martial arts in Chinese armies. They're horrible. I'm mean, not yeah. not the film, the martial arts practice. These guys are like they got like boxing gloves on, and they're yeah, you know, and it's 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 really unimpressive stuff. So the Tang had a very nice military uniform and yeah. sword and. All the sort of spangle. Um, so um, yeah, um, so that that's also uh, I think needs to be brought out. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, what you say is basically correct. I think uh, about the lack of historical continuity in these things. And um, I'll, I will I will sort of touch on Zhang Kong uh, I think later. But um, yeah, we have a question now. Um, well, that is a question, really. I mean, if it is a question, but, uh, should, should I have talked about the Japanese? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yes, but uh, uh, in a short talk, I I didn't want to uh, uh, dilate upon. Yeah, the, ja the Japanese side of it gets very. Uh, I mean, we we either know it here, or it would take me about an hour to lecture all the the background stuff. Yeah, you can't cover it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I did cut that aspect, and I cut a lot of Republican. China history, but you know, modern history is kind of boring anyway. So. We're all doing short <laughs> talks here. Ben, please. Uh, yes, oh, thank you both. Very interesting. Um, this may be a potential, it's always a stretch when I ask questions, but um, connecting this to internal yeah. practices, but over to John actually, because of something uh, we had a lovely uh, talk at lunch yesterday. And you mentioned something I found very interesting, and you didn't talk about it today, but I wonder if you might. That you were uh, that uh, you were invited to, and I don't know if you did partake in some sort of blindfolded activity where you would be able to learn to read while blindfolded via third eye, presumably. I, I'm very interested in this because this was a major scam going on in India, of course, at, at least a few years ago. It was a big deal and a big problem. So I wondered what sort of experience you had where this internal practices crossed over into, let's call the parapsychological or pseudo-psychic uh, practices. Yeah, I, so those practices that I was seeing were part of my time where I wasn't allowed to be in martial arts schools and I went far afield. Uh, in the martial arts schools themselves, the only evidence that I have of, of something close to that is from Western students coming in, hoping to shoot fireballs from their hands that kind of did thing. You, did you learn how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Two months now. I <laughs> not, not a fast enough study. But I mean, so when we look at these institutions as modernized traditionalism, there is an eff effort with the government support as you register these institutions to really clean up the image. Now, Wudong, because of its renown as this famous Taoist mountain, is drawing in everyone. And so uh, this discussion of transmission, it, it's also about cleaning up what's being presented there. And you are, people in the martial arts school are very critical and almost unwilling to talk about the random people working in the temple next to them, uh, doing strange motions, and then potentially training people to read with blindfolds on. Uh, there's no room for that. And Qigong was a term basically not used at most of the schools. Um, because of its negative associations um, in the 80s and 90s. So, yeah, all of that is happening. Uh, some of these banned practices, officially banned practices, are happening in the courtyards of temples. 
but they're not practiced within the schools themselves. I see. So you have so to it's, market. it's connected a bit to the Taoism, but not to the martial arts in particular. Yeah, it's everybody's trying to be a Taoist in some way. Yeah. So it's all connected to the Taoism, um, but the martial arts schools clean things up a lot more. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Then you next. Oh uh, yeah, actually, I was going to ask John too. I was fascinated with, with what you were talking about with the masters bringing you in and showing you the government plaque that I am an inheritor, right? Um, how, I, I was wondering if you could talk about your specific teachers. How did they explain their lineage? Did, did they give you a traditional lineage map? And then how does that work with, well, I need the government certification? Is, is it a substitute? Is it you know a support? How do these two systems of legitimacy work together? So I was never aware of any lineage charts on walls in the schools. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever saw that. It's more of a certificate-based thing. Mm -hmm. You've been recognized at this award thing and that award thing. Um, and then everybody knows. But they didn't teach you what, what their lineage was. There was like no kind of lineage transmission. My teacher was this, his teacher was that. There, were, there was lots of discussion about direct master relationships uh -huh. in the area. I mean, Wudong's a tiny town. Right. So everybody knows everybody, and you know who that direct master is, especially because they're going to be doing events together and called to participate in those things. But beyond one or two generations back, they don't really get specific. Um, I had a chart up there. What I could find was from the Grand Master Zhong Yulong, he, from the Sanfeng lineage he had his chart, and he's very explicit about all the different transmission lines, mm -hmm. um, one of which is from Xuanwu, one of which is from Senfeng, only a couple forms coming from Wudong specifically. But yeah, there wasn't a lot of discussion beyond those generations, those for one generation, two generations. So then the government plaque really is, it's your stamp, right? It, it is a substitute. Yeah for transmission as it would be understood in other places in the folk martial arts. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. there, there are, by the way, there's late 19th century, early 20th century lineage charts for those arts, um, for the internal style. So I'd be interested to see if they hook those ones into those or not, or they miss them, because very often the martial arts are in historians or scholars. So they don't actually find the actual records that there are. I mean, not that they're necessarily connected, but if they find the records, then they're gonna. They usually then go like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, that, that guy. We we got it from. So there actually are names of guys, and we have information from late nineteenth century people who are in these lineages of Bagua, Taiji, and things like that. Um, so you can break those down. Yeah, but uh, they don't. <laughs> they <laughs> don't. That's yeah, they don't get into that, and it actually. Sometimes they'll ask, well, Western students are very interested in this question, when did this art form come about? The Taiji 9 form was invented eight years ago. So, Wudong Taiji 9. And so you ask them after, didn't you make that? And they'll say, who told you that? You know, <laughs> you don't even want to talk about it. You can get them to admit that it's this guy at that college that did it. But they don't really want to get into the specifics. It's about presenting the image of coherence. 36 forms, all Wudong. Luke, down the back. sort of googly kind of way yeah. in my sort of attempts to sort of look at some of those histories. So I was being very kind of curious about this idea of the nature of Chua. And in a sense I'm, yeah. I'm completely in 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 um I, I kind of agree with this very cool picture that you get there's there's this sort of it's, it, it's kind of found in the early twentieth century as a word and connected to. Uh, but I was I, I always wondered whether Sun Tang took the term from Chen Tinghua because what I read yeah. on the internet yeah. is that Chen Tinghua had already kind of brought together, you know, he kind of had a sort of a circle that were doing Xin Yi Chuan, Tai Chi Chuan, and Bagua Zhang, and kind of, <laughs> strategy, <laughs> kind of stuff, and he kind of talked about, <coughs> talked about his group. Yeah, it's it's just Bagua Zhang, actually. I'm just wondering if there's any credence to that. Or so, so there's this really interesting thing that happens when you, so there's some really, 
reasonable scholarship on modern Chinese. And, and there's like you know dictionaries of famous martial arts stuff, and I've got a bunch of them on my. Uh, and I, I, at some point during the pandemic, but uh, for better or worse, it, the pandemic ended before I got to doing this. I was going to do a series of little videos on YouTube of the biographies of all of these guys and what we know about them, mm -hmm. and just sort of follow a couple of. You, know, you can go through all the lineages and follow them, what we actually know. In some cases, you, I mean, in some cases we have real data on them. Sometimes we don't. Um, we, we run into this really serious problem of again, what's very few martial artists practice one style. And, and I think if we went around the room to all the people who practice martial arts here, if you've been doing it for any length of time and you moved out of, particularly moved out of your town, you know, if someone asked me why I did all these different martial arts, well, I was in New York and I was doing it, and then I went to Texas where I was going to school, and then I moved around, you know, and then what do you do? You find another martial arts teacher and you, and almost no one does one martial art. Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, what, what distinguishes one from the other? And so, yeah, could, Sun Tong's teacher have already been doing this. Uh, and it depends on the, how much of an intellectual, and I use that very loosely, your teacher is. Uh, my teachers right now, uh, my head coach and my direct coach are both high school graduates. And they are, let's just say, not really into the intellectual side of things. My uh, head coach doesn't actually believe in evolution. Um, He's a very good jujitsu teacher, but you know there's limitations to what you can do with that. So it could well be what we lack. It gets back to this problem of people are trying to push back this concept. We have no ev direct evidence of these things, and we have movies with Tai Chi Zero and Tai Chi Hero, and you know, and we have these, and it's great <clears throat> stuff. And if it helps your martial arts practice to believe this stuff and you feel better and it helps your inter that's awesome but you can't you just I mean, we can't do it and occasionally people find mysterious ancient texts but there was one someone found a an ancient text from it was supposed to be like uh, um, UFA's martial arts style in a sausage casing that was ancient from the song you know <laughs> Uh, you know, how, how would you, and you know, the language isn't even Song Dynasty uh, uh, Wen Yan Wen, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's like bad 20th century faking of what, they, what Qing Dynasty Wen Yan Wen looks like. It's, some people would never write like that, but you know. So, I mean, and, and so then we're back to the question of what, and that's why I thought John's paper was so useful when I was talking, I was like, oh, I was just celebrating, because it is exactly this issue, and the government, and, and, and Ben was right, I mean, we were in a paper lab yesterday, where what's really going on is we're talking about government control over a narrative of martial arts and traditional culture, yes. and that's and and then there's the martial artists, right? You know, and <clears throat> could you please elaborate a bit more on the fact that you uh, are not you are not doing one martial art like uh, doing your course of a lifetime, yeah. like. Is it be truly because the, there are not the availability in all the cities, or is it because there are so many di disciplines to try that is encouraged to try all of them to reach pure mastery? So, so if you've done something like Taekwondo, <coughs> which probably half the people in this room have done Taekwondo because it's one of the most ubiquitous arts, you go in, it has a curriculum, you go through, it's very orderly, you promote, you learn the skills, it's very good. Um, I started it in full contact karate uh, and street fighting when I was 15. And I would very quickly realized, and we were throwing people on the ground and learning to hit them on the, you know, stamp on the ground. But my first thought was, oh my God, what happens when you get on the ground? I don't know what to do on the ground. At that time, there was, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was not available. Uh, very little, you know, Judo wasn't big on the Nawaza. You know, they throw people on the ground and they might do an arm bar, but you know, their, their rule set, in judo, it does not really allow you to set up your grappling game. It's, you have to like, it's like in three seconds, after you throw, you have like three seconds to try to establish like an arm bar on the ground. And honestly, if you get an epon, you're done. So you don't need to like try to then get a submission. Uh, and then, so I, personally, I had been looking for ground fighting. I had been waiting for it from when I was a teenager because I realized from a pragmatic point of view, and when I started, I was into pragmatic because I was growing up in Brooklyn, New York, and you know I wanted to defend myself. I was, you know, 
book reading nerd. Um, what happens when you get on the ground? And, and so that's why I did it. And if you read even modern martial artists, they'll talk about, well, I learned striking, and then I went and found a Mongolian teacher to teach me wrestling. Because you always want a step person. Mongolians teaching you wrestling is ideal. That's the guys you want to learn wrestling from. And, and so now, there, most martial arts I know, higher level people, have studied multiple martial arts. Um, I have very seldom run into someone who's like, I just do this one art, that's the only thing I've ever done, it's, and then and, and think that that's enough. Yeah, but that's, that's the way it is now, okay? Not in the past, when you had no media, no mobility, secrecy, lack of text, etc. Well, you had a teacher. <clears throat> you had one teacher who would tell you, you can only study with me, you buy down, uh, buy sure, end of story. You know, if you go yeah. and study with someone else, you're out. But the question is, <clears throat> when we look at things like, let's say like UFA's teacher taught him striking, but taught him sword, taught him archery. Um, so then we're back to the question of what is it to have, we, this stuff that we got every year we run around and around in this in martial arts, right? Mm -hmm. What is a style? What, what is it, what, which is an art and which is a technique? And in pre-modern China, you learned skills in different categories, not a style. So you learned unarmed fighting, you learned archery, you learned you know, spear fighting. These were separate skills. Maybe there was some guy who was particularly good at, I mean, there are guys in the Ming who are wandering around looking for guys who are particularly good. The same teacher could, like this, the one that you yeah. could teach a different art, but yeah. you still have to have the same teacher. You can't just say, okay, bye, I'm, I'm not gonna study this guy. Uh, well, but in the Ming, there are guys who wander around. They actually do. There are some, there yeah. are some, but you know. Do you have a question? Oh, you. <coughs> yeah, so, so like, like uh, speaking about that, now for what I've seen in Wudong, it's, it's really hard for um, a student to go from one master to the other. And so can we see its historical reason or is it just because of financial reason? I mean, what's your perspective from both? Yes. Uh, no, I mean, partly it's financial, right? Mm -hmm. And well, even let's just take something like uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. There's a very interesting video recently, and someone said, <clears throat> up until very recently in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there were not the international competitions. If you studied in one school, you didn't train in another school, you didn't tell anyone what you were doing, mm -hmm. and now you regularly you visit other schools, you they have videos, they put up all the stuff, and <clears throat> as a result, the art has gotten. But I mean, I'm talking about like recently, like two weeks before I came here, I was watching a video going, oh, that's the detail on that. And why wasn't I taught that? Well, my teacher wasn't, that's not his technique. Um, and so, and this is by the way, the problem the Chinese government's having now with the death of martial arts. And if you go to China, why you see all these Taekwondo schools in urban China and people aren't putting their kids in uh, Shaolin and, and Gong Fu, they're putting them in a Taekwondo school in Nanjing. You know, I pass the school and the kids are doing, I recognize the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's money, it's trying to restrict it, but it tends to kill the arts, but it also, the traditional arts, and this is the difficulty of this term, implies we reached a perfect form that is authentic. Again, one of those terms we keep going around and around here. Uh, we reached this authentic form, it was Master Wu Wei, uh, uh, deciphered the terms of stillness and repose at the pool of tears, and everything further from Master Wu Wei is less powerful. The closer you can get back to the location of the teacher, the more powerful it is because it's perfect. Now that's a nice, you know, I love Kung Fu Panda and it's great stuff. In the real world, the way you, an art develops and changes is, it's open, it's not traditional, but by the way, those traditional functions are starting in, in uh, jiu-jitsu now because you have people like uh, uh, John Donaher who's trying to perfect the art and create a curriculum. And you say, well, once he creates the art and gets the curriculum, if it's perfect, and, and he can be like Bruce Lee, right? Bruce Lee said that Jeet Kune Do was gonna keep changing all the time. Well, then he conveniently died. So then it's fixed. <laughs> and now if you don't do that the way he did it before he died, is that no longer Jeet Kune Do? So, but I mean, but money is huge. One down the back here. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the wonderful talks. I was wondering, 
Um, if I compare this to my European sources in the Middle Ages, um, I found a deep connection between the media, so the, 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 the fact that you're producing media on your martial art and the way this martial art develops. So one of the first texts mentioning a specific art is mentioning that the teacher traveled many lands, learned from, from many masters, and then perfected this art, he didn't invent it. So this is the trope that is set. And, um, but then people start to write down this art, which are encrypted verses, and which are then, uh, well, um, the people uh, start writing glosses about it because they can't understand what the, the verses yeah. themselves meant. And so uh, then this tradition um, of people commenting on these verses for 200 years starts. And it's a really, it's a locally phenomenon because it's only German texts doing this related to those verses. There are other texts, but something different. So the question related to this is, how would you um, frame the, the relationship between media and putting down information about your practice and the establishment of styles and schools and names and designations? How would you relate this? So it, it, there is a big, I mean, John's going to see it much more in, because he's seeing this model, you're seeing this much more in the modern, where they're trying to create this through media. Uh, this is a very big issue of difference between Europe and China, because we don't have the texts. Uh, and like I said, if you read that exceedingly boring article I wrote on the uh, bibliography of Chinese martial arts texts in uh, the, what's that, the martial arts studies thing that Paul did, uh, there were texts. We don't know what function they served. Because we don't have the contents, we don't know what they did. Uh, you know, again, uh, what Ben was saying, we're looking for legitimacy right here, and, and we're selling it. Why should you come study with me? So, you know, when you go to, you know, you guys doing HEMA, you have to recreate, you don't have, and I'll give it a few years, and there'll be some guys who are like, you know, I am the guy who figured it out, and then everyone will go, no! But already happening. Already happening. <laughs> and that's what, look, it, you know, it's money. And, and, you know, people have to make a living, and that's a great thing. And as long as they're not hurting people, uh, you know, the martial arts, the, our big question about hurting people is, you teach someone, they convince them that they're, they're invincible, and they go and get themselves in trouble, because they walk in, instead of avoiding a situation, they go into it, because they're like, I've learned martial arts, I'm gonna go do that, and they get, and then they're like, oh, what happened? It's like, and then teach them, well, you know, you, you were bad, but my martial art was good. You know, you didn't understand it, right? And so, there's very, how do you, how do you legitimize yourself, right? In China right now, it's the government. Uh, in China right now, it's movies, making Wudang and Shaolin, these centers, I can tell you, when I published my earlier book, there were furious people who hated me because I said that Shaolin was not the source of martial arts. They were, oh, how can, obviously this guy's an idiot. <laughs> now, I might be an idiot, but not for that reason. Um, and, and, you know, Wudang, Wudang is, what is the, it's a, so when you write this stuff, you, there are people who are seeking that legitimacy. I think this, you go travel around and do a lot of stuff, and here's what I've, so the, the, we were talking about, was, people were talking about Prabhupada yesterday. There's a guy, what's his name, Ryan Hoover, in America, he does his YouTube channel, he does self-defense, and he said he wanted to get rid of Prabhupada as his designation because he thought it constrained the art. He's only interested in effectiveness. Only, 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 he doesn't want to be constrained, he wants, if a new thing comes in, someone shows him it doesn't work, he wants to change it, but he found financially, you have to label it. So he calls it Krav Maga. It's so evolved from, now, and of course, like good scholars, we'd all go in and say, no, but I can see that technique. You pulled that from there, and, and that's still there. So, so legitimacy, I mean, that's what you write the text for, right? Uh, legitimacy, you know, we're academics, we write texts, we produce them for, to prove that we know something. Uh, Did you have a response, John? Sure. There's something you want to say? Uh, yeah, responses vary in Wudong from what I'm seeing. A lot of the legitimacy comes from just having a number by your name, 15th generation. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it comes from media videos now, right? So people will come to Wudong because they saw a video and they went, whoa, you can do that with your body. Uh, but Certain masters are presenting themselves as more scholastic, 
And so you know, you'll talk to somebody, and the, the texts that do exist matter a lot to them, and they're studying every book that comes out so that they can say, actually, uh, Guo Gai, who was the guy who revitalized Wudang arts with Tai Chi 108, well, he actually messed up these three moves. That's not how they were done. But it's best not to talk about it too much. You know, don't tell a lot of people. But uh, I told you, and then you can study from me because I've got the real thing. And and it, then he, this particular master, he described it as a non-standardized standardization. Nobody asked him to do it, um, and there is really no curriculum that you're studying. You're just going out there for your personal interest and creating standards. Would you say that videos are the new a new way to so like yeah. Before writing, before writing a book was a thing, and now it's making videos. Right. Yes. And there's different markets. So very different markets: China versus the U.S. And the U.S. people are looking at YouTube videos, and China. There's uh, now a move from blogging to short billy billy, uh, then to live stream. And especially with coronavirus now, I mean, this is a way to try to maintain yourself as a center of the art when people can no longer come to the center. So they are, if you go around some of these schools, it's that person over there with a camera, that person over there with a camera live streaming to everybody else mm -hmm. um, and creating that connection. Um, yeah. So I have a, I have a question um, about scholarly narrative. I mean, it's really strong. I love these papers. I love listening. Um, it's really interesting to me as somebody who's watched thousands, literally, of Hong Kong films, uh, how many years all I knew was Wu Dang is bad. <laughs> you know, and then one day I'm watching a movie and I go, oh my God, this, this guy's from Wu Dang and he's a hero, how can that be? Um, so, a bit of making up to do there. Uh, but then I was taught boxing by uh, Hong Kong. Cantonese blokes who would joke about Tai Chi as mahjong. You know, they go around <laughs> the gym. So, but what's really striking to me is that both of your papers are stories of entrepreneurialism. And it makes sense in both cases and it's evidence based in both cases. But what does that tell us about the stories that as scholars we're interested in now? and what other possible ways of using the material, non uh, phantasmally, might there be? I mean, in our era, the story of entrepreneurialism is really one of the founding theoretical um, tropes, let's say, of a whole lot of projects. Why are we so interested in interpreting things through entrepreneurialism? whether of the state, uh, of individuals finding place relative to the pressures of the state and, and a convulsing society. But what other, could there be another way of being, um, of relating to these issues? You're young. I don't have any ways of doing this anymore. <laughs> I'm not sure how to, how to answer that. I was just interested in the most dynamic spaces of change for Taoism get this yes. discussion of Taoism in decline, and it's not interesting to a new generation, or it's too mysterious. Every time I tell somebody I'm studying Taoism, they're like, well, I don't even want to talk about it. It's too mysterious. It doesn't make sense. Uh, Buddhism is doing a little bit better job of outreach. Um, but I just wanted to see this space of change, and that just happened to coincide with entrepreneurship. How do you market yourself and, and present to the public uh, at a time when it feels very important to get these things to continue, to bring them back and continue them. Um, entrepreneurship, not necessarily a term they use, but you know, you hear within the Chinese society right now, there is such a focus oh. on money. Okay. So it's, it's almost inescapable. And I was studying with a, a master, and he says, you can live in a temple, and you can make a stipend of $3,500 a month. And then on top of that, you can get some ritual service fees. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to have a family, and I need another option. And so he's like, in Wudong, what you see a lot more of are scattered Taoists running wild. And you just, everybody has a product. And if you go to a place, they say, well, you can keep teaching martial arts, but 
you can't support yourself only on martial arts. So really you need these sesame seed balls and you need to be making rice wine in the back and you need to be marketing all these products. Uh, so yeah, the market of traditional <coughs> culture, it's inescapable mm -hmm. and, and I can't help being fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's interesting, you know, you're, you're a religious historian. And of course we have mm -hmm. Meyer Shahar, who's a religious historian. We have all these religious historians coming at these martial arts. And, and what's great about the conference room is that we have all these different angles. But um, you know, for me, it's mostly just about trying to figure out why do people think what they think about these things? Because you know, well, someone comes to you and asks you to teach you something. Okay, what, is you, what are you trying to get out of this? And, and if you're trying to get self-defense, like we're not gonna tell you, you know, stand there still for five hours, you know, we're gonna try to oh, go, go do Krav Maga. Uh, and it's an estimation. Uh, I mean, uh, and then there's this thing about marketing traditionalism because we're trying to get back to some sort of somatic expression of traditionalism. We get that Han Fu and we get the, you know, the, why? Because it makes people happy. Yeah, I'm I mean, saying, and there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. No, no, it's just interesting. I, I just wonder whether I say entrepreneurialism actually rather than ship, which is more like the pragmatic cases. But in a way, today for academics, isn't it partly our equivalent of thunderbolts from your hand? I mean, it's, it's those stories of enablement despite whatever that are quite inspiring. Well, they're going to be licensing. You know, in yeah. the UK, uh, health qigong, which is you know a yeah, bunch of you know, what, uh, is actually suing people uh, for using those terms which they were already using uh, because they trademarked it. Right. And you know it went through before anyone could you know yeah. realize what was going on. So now they have to fight in court and they don't have the money uh, to combat you know. Uh, so. What can you do? Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe in China this is, is going to be the new trend, I don't know, of licensing, possibly, do you think? I couldn't say. Yeah, I mean, things are changing, you know, religion, the attitude is changing. Anyway, 